Hello everyone, the Skilled Roy here, back with another Legends of Runeterra video, and today we are going to be reviewing all of the Lurk cards and putting them on a nice fancy tier list here. Get out of here, Ad. So, what makes a good Lurk card, and what makes me someone good enough to tell you about it? Well, unfortunately, I play way too much Lurk because Pike has been constrained to this archetype, and I love Pike more than anything. Uh, so unfortunately, that means that I have to play Lurk, and that means I've had to master it uh, in order to know anything about this game, which is rather unfortunate in many ways. Um, so yeah, we're going to go in, I guess, the order from left to right here uh, in terms of what's good. I do notice that Ripper's Bay is missing, um, which is correct, because that's not a Lurk card, okay? As much as, much as people want to cope, sorry, Sunny, sorry, Absol. It's just not happening, okay? I'm telling you this right now. Number one pike one trick right here. It's just, it's just not a thing. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry. Anyways, let's get into it. So, uh, first things first, we got the Redfin Hammer Snout. Uh, for those who don't know, this is a two mana, one, two with Lurk. Uh, grants an enemy vulnerable. So this is an extremely, extremely good card. Um, this is one of the main ways you have any interaction that's relatively consistent in your deck. Hitting Pike off the top is just, let's be honest, not realistic. Uh, imagine hitting it twice in a row in one game. That couldn't have just been me, but who knows? Uh, <laughs> so basically what I'm saying is with this card is your goal is realistically to be able to answer key threats uh, and set up your lethals with uh, with like your overwhelm units, right? And one of the best ways to, to do that is with this card because this card is like, Think about it, guys. People still play, to this day, Merciless Hunter, which is a 4-2 uh, fearsome uh, grant something vulnerable. And Redfin Hammersnout is an infinite attack 2 HP unit that will just, like, dive bomb at someone and kill it. So, like, generally, card's pretty fantastic, especially in the late game. The, the power of Lurk in particular comes in, like, the mid to late turns when you can start playing a lot of these huge threats one after each other all in the same turn. And then what you do is you sequence it in such a way that you play this last. That way, when the opponent develops their defenses to match you, you can pull the big target that you want out of the way and easily kill it with Redfin. Uh, for that reason alone, it's definitely going to be an A tier Lurk card. This card is, like, like the way I'm evaluating this is that if we didn't have Redfin Hammer Snout, we would be losing a vast majority more games. Like, not having this card is very, very, very bad for many reasons. So next up is Snapjaw Swarm. Uh, best card in Lurk, unironically. I think this card is unbelievably broken. Um, if there's one card in the deck that I think is objectively the strongest, I think it's this one. Um, so let me let me break it down. So first things first, Snapjaw Swarm is good at all stages of the game. That is not something that many Lurk cards can say. Some struggle early, some struggle late, but Snapjaw is always good. And the reason why is because it lets you activate your Lurk triggers on the opponent's turn. Remember, you can only activate Lurk once per turn, So, but technically, if you can activate on the opponent's turn via free attack, it's a great way to do that. Snapjaw Swarm is so good, it makes another card on this list almost good. Like, let's put that in perspective. That's how insanely good Snapjaw Swarm is. Um, so anyways, Snapjaw Swarm, really, really solid card. It basically fulfills a lot of the early game where you can activate your Lurk on the opponent's turn. But what gets really strong in particular is that it also lets you do combos too. It lets you do like call the pack on the opponent's turn, see what you get, get a Snapjaw Swarm, play the Snapjaw Swarm. It activates the Lurk on the top of your deck. Also in the late game, when your opponents are trading back and forth a lot, which you're going to see a lot because eventually they kind of they kind of have to stop fighting you and they kind of have to fight the the giant monsters you're summoning on the, on the board. Eventually, you're gonna, they're going to keep trading down or you're going to see them spend a lot of mana to answer you. And what you're going to do is you're going to play Call the Pack and they are going to cry. Like, just like, it's not Call the Pack. You're going to play Snapjaw Swarm and they are going to cry. Like... You're gonna play it, boom, 7-2 coming at you. And they're just like, oh shit, like what do I do now? And this is especially important when they start trying to stabilize. Like imagine turn nine, you attack. You get a huge attack off, they're on low HP. They're like, oh, don't worry though. I'm gonna play Karma and then I'm gonna play double health potion and heal myself back up, like on turn nine, right? And then you're like, Snapjaw Swarm, either lose the game or give me your Karma, you know? And like, that's something you're gonna be able to do to your opponent a lot, especially with Snapjaw Swarm. Like this card is, I can't understate it enough how good this card is. Um, it's easily like one of the most skill testing and the strongest part of the deck by far because sometimes you don't want to activate it Sometimes you want to hold it. There's time. It's, it's kind of like a bullet, you know It's just you got it's your ammo It's your way to get like line up a nice window to hit them in the face for a bunch of damage or kill a key unit And I think that's why snapjaw swarm is just godlike 
Um, it is so godlike that Bloodbait is occasionally run. Unfortunately, it's still bad. Um, so Bloodbait is really bad in a lot of ways because Lurk as an archetype is extremely, extremely strong uh, when you can trade one to one with your opponent consistently because eventually they're not going to be able to answer you because your units continuously keep scaling up, right? So in in the in the late game when you're playing like a one mana eight two and they kind of have to block it with their five drop or else they die. It's really, really strong for doing that. However, the issue with Bloodbait, though, is that since it places a card on top of your deck and you discard a card to do that, it essentially means you just discarded a card for nothing. Um, yes, guaranteeing a Snapjaw on top of your deck is good, but it unfortunately also means that Bloodbait kind of makes you lose a card for free. Uh, and that's just not great, obviously. Um, now, there is one clear combo here, okay? So, when you hit Rek'Sai, so let's just say on turn three, for example, you attack and you activate Rek'Sai off the top of your deck. You're like, hell yeah. Rek'Sai plus two attacked my entire units. Feels great, man. But then, what you can do is you can play Bloodbait. Bloodbait puts the Snapjaw on top of the Rek'Sai, who you know is on top of the deck. Next turn comes around. You draw Snapjaw, and boom, you can play Snapjaw on the opponent's turn. It attacks, activating the same Rek'Sai again, and that gives you even more damage, right? Like, th that is just crazy. And that high roll is the only reason why Bloodbait gets played occasionally. And even then, it's entirely on the back upon how broken Snapjaw is. Um, so yeah, Bloodbait, not good enough. But the fact that it makes the best Lurk card is almost good enough. And that's kind of crazy, right? Uh, I'm going to save Champions for last. Uh, Jawfish. This is another S tier card. Uh, even though my Jawfishes hate me and they like actively choose the worst possible targets at all times, uh, which is really frustrating, uh, it is the best card in Lurk for you to tie up the late game. And the way you do this is like, again, you're going to be attacking a lot. You're going to be playing a lot of these units that have infinite attack and the opponent has to keep blocking them over and over and over again. And eventually you get down to these situations where you have like one extra Lurk and you have Jawfish in hand. But that combination lets you answer so much. Any barrier unit, any spell shield unit, anything they play just explodes on the spot. And the big thing, the big, like, sort of, I mean, I want to say skill testing, but it's fairly obvious, is that in the late game, you want to be playing around that Jawfish at all times, whether that's drawing it off the top of your deck or generating it off Call of the Pack or generating it off Rek'Sai. Like, your goal with Jawfish is to set up a board state where you completely blow them out or you completely negate any sort of counter spell to you, right? And that means, like, piercing a barrier, going through, again, since it makes multiple skills, you can't really deny it easily unless you're playing Shirima. Um, it goes through spell shields because you're gonna use, you, you have multiple lurks presumably, right? Like overall, Jawfish is a great way to get back those late game turns. Now, obviously, obviously, Jawfish is pretty bad in the early game. And I, I think that's what makes it like a tier below Snapjaw. Like if we're being honest, this should be called like Snapjaw like for S tier, you know what I mean? S for Snapjaw, um, because this card is that fucking good. Like, so you could argue it goes into A instead, but I really think Jawfish does win a lot of games and it deserves to be up there uh, next to Snapjaw. Cause I've definitely stolen way too many games of Jawfish. Uh, it's just sort of how it goes. Sharkling. Sharkling is in the A tier, solid role player in your deck. You're always gonna be happy to see a, a Sharkling. Now Sharkling and and Hatchling are, a set, I'm gonna put them up, up at the same time. These two cards are identical. They are the same card, except they have different use cases, okay? Xersai Hatchling is insane against slow-paced control decks that do not have small answers, okay? This means a deck that doesn't have, like, Vile Feast, a deck that doesn't have Go Hard, a deck that doesn't have, like, Mystic... Sh uh, not Mystic Shot, but, like, Make It Rain. Like, any deck that has no pings, Xersai Hatchling is going to carry you so far. And what I mean by that, typically is like Ionia decks. Ionia decks generally don't have a great answer for Xersai Hatchling that doesn't two for one themselves. So you're gonna be really happy to have Xersai Hatchling in those matchups. However, conversely, Sharkling is the same thing, but for decks that do have that ping, because decks that have Make It Rain, Thermo Beam, uh, Vile Feast, you need to be dead certain that you're gonna get that attack off on turn one, because if you miss Lurk, in the early turns, you kind of fall apart, right? So making sure, let's say you have both of these cards in your hand, turn one against like P and Z Targon or whatever the whatever archetype you're facing off against, you have to know which one is the correct one to play because you will just dead ass lose a game on the spot if they have the thermal beam to stop you or if they have the proper blocker to stop you. And knowing where that line is, is really, really important. 
obviously, inherently, Xerxai Hatchling having Fearsome puts it slightly above Sharkling in most situations, because even in the late game, the opponent doesn't really want to be spending a ping on a one-mana card, uh, especially when it comes to action economy. Uh, they, want it on their, they want it on your spell shields. They want it to stop your other units. You're going to be playing so many cards out. But these cards are both really, really strong in that they're both one-drops, which means you're going to be able to develop a really wide board to set up for your Jawfish, set up for your huge Rek'Sai turns, set up in general for, like, big swings, right? Like, these cards are both huge, 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 huge role players in the deck, and they're both very, very good for that. Uh, next up is Call the Pack. Uh, Call the Pack is also in... Where do I put this? I'm going to beat here. Rek'Sai, uh, sorry, not Rek'Sai's Callback, but Call the Pack in general is a very strong card, but it's not as good. I'm just going to go to D, actually. Um, it's not as good as people make it out to be. Yes, it sets up your champions like Rek'Sai and Pike, um, but you can't just go for that all the time because it does put you pretty tempo negative. Thankfully, we don't run many spells to begin with, so usually we don't, we never really feel the power of this. But one thing that you can really get you in trouble, especially, is that if you, like, play Call the Pack in a situation where you don't have the spell mana to really develop efficiently and you and you hit like a five drop and a six drop with your call the pack and you just have nothing you are just you're dead you're dead you're dead in the water you know what i'm saying so call the pack is good but it's not that good you know what i'm saying but yeah so next up we got zerside dune breaker and i'm sorry i'm sorry my favorite my favorite beetly boy he's uh he's in c um yeah, so Zerusai Dunebreaker, he's not bad per se. It's just that he's definitely probably one of the worst uh, <laughs> lurkers. Uh, the main issue for this, right, is that like even though he has the overwhelm keyword at six mana, you're just not gonna get included in most. Not, in mo sorry, you're just not. You're just get answered way too often. You're gonna get bounced. You're gonna get removal spelled. You're gonna get destroyed. Yeah, he's just an alpha wild claw. Um, Ripper's Bay absence is part of the bay. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, Doombreaker, uh, you know, he's just he's just not gonna do too well. Unfortunately, um, he's he's there. He's there to be a threat, but rarely will I ever win games with Zerzai Doombreaker. This is just here to take removal spells for your Zerzarath and your Rexai. Not to mention, six mana is a really awkward spot to be in uh, because it puts you at a pricing out of so many cards in the game. Um, just not not a good time. Not a good time. Not about it. Next up. Zerzarath, he's also my boy, but he's going into B tier. Uh, Zerzarath's power mostly comes from how strong the other Lurk cards are. Um, because when he comes down, he's your finisher, right? He's your Ruin Runner. He's coming in there with a billion health, a billion attack, Spell Shield Overwhelm Fearsome, and he's just going to kill you. And he does do that a lot. And him being five mana is really crucial in those late turns where you do get to play two, and then you just completely obliterate them. You guys just saw a game, actually, um, when I was playing this on stream, that actually had me hit both of them and kind of just ran them over. And, like, that was kind of like, sorry, buddy, that's just how it goes. But, uh, yeah, the card is really good. But the, the problem with it, though, is that this is never a good card unless you hit Rek'Sai, unless you hit Snapjaw Swarm, or unless you get, get away with murder, essentially. Um, so this card is just not... It's good, and it's something that needs to be in the deck, but it's just not going to be... It's not going to get you to those wins. It's like the payoff for this deck. It's not It's not something that's going to get get you out of a jam, right? Um, not like some of these other cards can. This card is just like, hey, if you're winning, you've won. These cards up here can all be like, hey, the game's even, or you're losing, and you can still bring it back somehow. Um, but yeah. Speaking of which, Zerzai Collar. This is like... This is... on the. This is the gatekeeper of S tier. Right, Zerzai Collar is is really strong. Obviously, having predict is one of the the most important keywords to have in Lurk because it lets you hit your champions more frequently. Um, and this card is just really strong because it also has three health. Having three health is really important when half of our goddamn cards have two HP. Uh, so that's just generally really really important, right? So like. This is like a huge, hugely important card for the archetype. Being able to hit your champions more reliably, being able to hit Lurk more reliably, being able to attack more often because it has three health. Like, this card will get you a lot of mileage. Um, and the only downside of this card is that it's a little too expensive for what we want to be doing at certain turns, right? It's hard to develop Zerts like Caller without one of the other one drops, right? Um, it's hard to really go wide with this card sometimes because you, the other cards just cost too much. It's in that awkward middle zone, you know what I mean? Like, it could be insane if this costed less and had less stats. Because, you know, if it's like a 1-1 one, one with Predict at 2 mana, I would play the hell out of this card. Um, but we don't have that, unfortunately. 
Uh, but yeah, card's good. It's not really, it's too hard to really like get into the weeds of this as to why it's extremely good. But I, you know, I, I like the card and I, I think it's a, I think it's a solid card for the archetype. Lastly, Blood in the Water. This is right here, I'd say. So Blood in the Water is also an insanely important card in Lurk. And the main reason for it is like the threat of it. You don't have to run too many of these because again, we are running typically six predicts uh, and you're going to hit one eventually uh, just because of how it sort of works out. But the purpose of this is that we really need this card to absolutely hit the board uh, against really greedy metas. Metas that have a lot of just pure value grinding, lots of people sitting back and just fucking farming it out, you know? Like, you need to have this card in the game so that we can finally answer them and stop them. Previously, what we had to do is we had to hold Snapjaw Swarms in our hand and then, like, rapid fire them out of our hand when the opponent left their guard down, right? But Blood in the Water lets us take attacks that are way greedier. Like, we're talking insanely greedy. Right? Like, you're able to do things like, for example, like do a full swing with your initial attack, then play Blood in the Water, kill them. It also lets you do uh, Rek'Sai on the opponent's turn with Blood in the Water. And like, the threat of these things is extremely important. Because as you keep playing the game and as you keep playing Lurk, you're going to put them at the opponent in so, so many binds that they have to start like spending a lot of mana to answer your cheap and extremely threatening units. And when you do that, right after you can be like, okay, boom, Rek'Sai, boom, Blood in the Water, GG. You know, and like that's an eight mana combo, but like that's three spell mana. That's like, you know, it's not that's not impossible. That's a turn five, you know? Um, and the fact that it also does one damage lets you do some extra little cheeky damage to the Nexus, or lets you legitimately stop like these small little dudes who can just block your gigantic unit, you know? So like Blood in the Water is fantastic. The biggest issue with it obviously is that like drawing too many really sucks because again, Lurk needs units. Um and like I I, I think you you've it's hard to really describe this without going into like the really in-depth parts of Lurk, but basically like the card is strong, but it's the threat of it that's stronger uh, against good players. Because they'll be like, oh shit, he's blood in the water. I gotta I got I got wait for a sec, you know? And like bluffing that and having its existence be around is really, really important. Blood in the water is in, in Swain decks it looks cute too. Oh, I haven't thought about that. That sounds adorable. I would love to try that out sometime. Um, but yeah. And lastly, we got Pike and Rek'Sai. This is controversial for some people, I know, but uh, it looks like this. Pike is the more important card in Lurk overall. Um, and this is purely because in a game that has interaction like ours does, having the ability to threaten Pike is one of the most important things in the game because it lets you kill just about anything and it immediately gives you a threat that's gigantic. The entire reason why Lurk can survive as an archetype even is because we constantly trade ourselves down in the early game, right? We take these suicidal attacks that like bring us low on cards, but then we get a Pike turn or we get a Rek'Sai turn that completely changes things around. But Pike in particular is disruptive, whereas Rek'Sai is really, really answered, easy to answer. So like overall, I give have to give the credit to Pike. Pike is worse in Ionia metas, that's undeniable, but Rek'Sai isn't great in Ionia metas either. So it's like, you know, you, gotta, you kind of have to balance it out the best you can. So Pike is probably an inch higher than Rek'Sai, um, but both are extremely important and you're never upset to see them. Now, what really matters the most between the two of them, especially when you start getting these situations where you hit predict and you see both of them in your predictions, you have to start knowing your matchups. Like, hey, do I need a removal spell in this matchup or do I need to race them in this matchup? Do I have a threshold I have to hit in order to stop them. Like for example, against like against like Fearsome, you're gonna want the early Rek'Sai, right? Because you need to hit higher attacks so you can deal with the minus attack abilities they have and be able to block their Fearsomes, right? Or against like high priority matchups where the opponent has a bunch of like really must kill units, you're not gonna have enough hammer snaps. You know what I mean? You're gonna need to hit to hit those pikes, right? I haven't heard you say like, ah, fuck Rek'Sai, that's not good. Yeah, because there, there's sometimes Rek'Sai's just a dead card, right? Unfortunately, that's just how it is. Or another big problem is that Rek'Sai's power is, is constrained a lot on opposite turns. So uh, allow, allow me to explain this, right? Uh, in certain situations, when you have a ton of, of Lurk power on your attacking turn, let's say you play Predict, you see Pike and Rek'Sai in your hand, right? You can attack this turn, but the attack isn't great for you, even with the bonus stats for Rek'Sai, right? So let's just say you attack here, you get the Rek'Sai trigger, you draw Rek'Sai the turn after, you still can't use Rek'Sai yet, remember, because it doesn't come until the turn after. 
but Pike is interesting because he lets you do more stuff on the opponent's turn. And mana efficiency in Lurk is really, really, really like something that's difficult to manage because we don't have very many spells, right? So the fact that Pike can burn that spell mana, which you will almost always have, is just like really, really good. He lets you play in a way that just the deck isn't normally able to do. And if I were to say anything, I think that the, the, the skill expression on Snapjaw Swarm and Pike are like two of the best parts of the deck for me as well as like one way i can easily like point out strong lurk players because they use them in ways that are a lot more interesting and are a lot more focused on the tempo of the game rather than just like oh i gotta kill this thing or oh i just want to activate lurk right there's a lot more cool shit you can do with them um but yeah there you go that is my incredible 60k mastery uh lurk tier list where i just talk about lurk cards for like what was that fucking 30 minutes jesus christ um but yeah, let me know what you guys think about that. And if you guys want to see more tier list content, hit me up with the skilled Roy on Twitter or on YouTube. Wow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Peace out, YouTube people.